It's been a year since four University of Idaho students were brutally stabbed to death in a horrific home invasion that shocked the country. Ethan Chapin, Zana Carnoto, Kaylee Gonzalez, and Madison Mogan were discovered slaughtered inside their off-campus home on Kings Road in Moscow, Idaho. A seven-week manhunt ended in the arrest of a PhD student who studied in a nearby town. Brian Koberger was cupped thousands of miles away from the crime scene at his parents' home in Pennsylvania. The former Ph.D. student declined to offer a plea at his arraignment and has since waived his right to a speedy trial, meaning a trial has been put on pause indefinitely. But what can we expect when what could be the case of the century begins? According to former prosecutor, now criminal defense attorney Matthew Mangino, the case has been built on a lot of circumstantial evidence. And that doesn't mean that you can't... Uh prove a circumstantial case. Certainly, um, you know, many cases are proved without direct eyewitnesses and other things. What I would like to see here, obviously, is, you know, connecting the dots. You know, we know that there's uh, telephone evidence, uh, you know, uh, his cell phone, Brian Kohlberger's cell phone was in the area of where these murders occurred. We know there's videotape uh, that, that uh, surveillance uh, cameras, uh, you know, home cameras, uh, traffic cameras have captured his vehicle, this white uh, Elantra. Uh, and, and then we know that there is DNA evidence, uh, although it's very minute. It's on a sheath uh, that was found at the, at the crime scene, and it was matched through uh, genealogy uh, DNA. And, uh, uh, you know, ultimately, when he was arrested, DNA was drawn, and, and, and there is a match between the two. So, you know, how did that get there? How did the the police, uh, you know, know uh, to, 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 you know, move forward with the genealogical uh, investigation uh, of independent uh, businesses? And, and ultimately, how did they make that match? So those are all, those are all questions that I think, um, you know, jurors are going to want to hear. How do you connect all these dots together? The state has touted the use of DNA to build its case, which detectives say linked Koberger directly to the crime scene. The biggest link? DNA discovered on the button snap of a knife sheath found near the body of Madison Mogan and Kaylee Gonzalez. Matthew Mangino says this DNA will play a crucial role in the trial, but it's not the only hand the prosecutors could deal. What we also know is that, that this is a, a very uh, minute piece of DNA uh, that was on this sheath that, that matches him, you know, you know, how does that place him there? Is there any other explanation for this, uh, this DNA being found there? Is this potentially uh, just, you know, touch DNA, which is a very small amount of DNA uh, that, that could have been transferred by who knows what means uh, as part of this investigation. I also look for there to be a lot of talk about the lack of DNA evidence. And we know that there is no DNA evidence, or at least that's what we know from media reports, that there's no DNA evidence that was found in, in Kohlberger's vehicle from any of the victims in this case. And no other DNA uh, evidence found in his apartment from any of the victims of this case. So that's going to be significant because we know that this was a, a brutal massacre of these four young college students and there was a lot of blood and you know typically you know you might find some trace of blood somewhere with a defendant uh when you have so much of it from four victims here i don't i don't think it's going to be all about dna and science i, I you know i think that's going to play a role uh you know it, it's not as though um you know you have uh, blood smears of uh um uh, you know, on the apartment wall and, in, 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 you know, in his car or something like that. that, that you don't have that, okay? You do have his DNA there for some, you know, if you're the defense, some, uh, you know, inexplicable reason, but you're also going to challenge, you know, how it got there and, 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 and how it led to his arrest in this case. And was there probable cause even to arrest him uh, based on this, this information? Now, we have a match from a later uh, DNA uh, sample from him, but you know how how did you get to that point? And so so that's going to happen during trial. That that's going to there's going to be a lot made of that during pretrial. We already saw a challenge to the grand jury 
um, instructions, which which the court denied. But but you know there there are going to be a lot of challenges to the evidence at this point. We don't even know what evidence is ultimately going to be admissible in this case. That's going to be decided through uh, motions in limine and other uh, types of pretrial uh, motions before we ever get to picking a jury in this case. The next piece to the puzzle for prosecutors, possible witnesses to the crime itself. We know two other roommates were at the off-campus apartment when the murders occurred. Investigators say one of the roommates came face to face with the killer. It's certainly going to be an important um, piece of the trial. It's certainly going to be something that's going to be presented to this jury. But, you know, it has the potential, you know, almost, you know, to work, you know, in, in both ways, you know, for the prosecution and, and for the defense. According to a police affidavit, Dylan Moritzen came face to face with the alleged killer moments after the gruesome stabbings of her friends. Morrison told police she opened her door after hearing someone crying and saw a figure in black clothing and a mask that covered that person's nose and mouth walking toward her. She described the figure as someone 5'10 or taller, male, not very muscular, but athletically built with bushy eyebrows. The affidavit goes on to state Morrison stood in shock then locked herself in her room after seeing the man who she says she didn't recognize. I mean, certainly they're going to, she can't identify the person. She didn't know the person. You know, the person vaguely uh, falls in line with the stature of um, of Brian Colbert. But, you know, if you're, if you're on the defense, you're going to say, hey, this guy was there. And, you know, number one, no one tried to stop him. No one did anything to identify him. No one even immediately called the authorities, called the police. Uh, when you when you observe this strange person with a mask on, dressed in black, leaving your apartment after you heard some some um, talk that that raised your suspicion about what was going on in the hallway, you know. So this this can cut both ways. We have to remember that the the onus, the burden, is on the prosecution. And the prosecution has to prove these case, this case, as in every criminal case, beyond a reasonable doubt. You know, now that's not an easy thing to define, even for someone like myself who's practiced both criminal defense and as as a prosecutor. But uh, things like why didn't you call the police until noon the following? You know, the, the later that morning, you know, eight hours after uh, there was this confrontation with, or, or at least the observation of someone leaving strange noises being in there, you know, those kind of things tend to cloud the case. And, and they tend to make jurors think about things that maybe uh, the prosecution doesn't want them to or maybe aren't really relevant. You know, people react to trauma in, in many different ways. And, and seeing someone m walking out of your apartment at four in the morning is a traumatic experience. So we don't always know how, you know, each individual is going to react to something like that. But, but I think that the fact that, that the police were never called until noon and that the reason for the call was somebody was unresponsive or, or, uh, you know, passed out. I mean, those things just kind of make the water murky uh, when, as a prosecutor, you want jurors to focus in and zero in on the important issues in the case. I I'd like to hear, uh, you know, from the neighbors that came over the next day um, who, who were, you know, called over because they couldn't find the other four who, were, who who had been murdered or they they were worried about where they were you know I'd, I'd just like to get I'd like to hear their perspective on it what exactly uh, they observed when they came there and what the demeanor was of the the surviving roommates and things like that you know was there genuine concern or what you know what was what were the circumstances and, you know so I think that would be important uh you know and, and is there anybody uh, who, who, and we don't know this, you know, and, and this investigation is going to continue. I mean, is there anything um, about Brian Kohlberger that a witness could tell us that might provide some insight about him or his frame of mind or, or what he was interested in at the time? Th those all 
you know, just like your your click history on your computer, you know, but you're looking up things you're interested, you want to know about, you're also talking about those things sometimes too. And that's important to know as well. Next up for the evidence is cell phone data and surveillance footage, some of which was shared to the media as a desperate plea from police to the public for help. Detectives say a review of nearby surveillance footage showed multiple sightings of a white Hyundai Elantra that made three passes of the King's Road home before entering the area for a fourth time shortly after 4 a.m. Police traced the car's travel to nearby Pullman, Washington, where Koberger lived while attending Washington State. Plus, get this. Koberger's phone was also tracked to Moscow before and after the attack, but his phone was off from 2.47 a.m. to 4.48 a.m., which was when investigators say the murders happened. But I think it's the most important evidence in the case because it puts him there. It puts him in the area. It puts him there before the murders occurred as, you know, as though as may, maybe he's he's casing the place. He's trying to, to, to make a plan for when he's ultimately going to carry out uh, these murders. So, so that's extremely important. And of course, uh, for the prosecution, his DNA on this sheath in, in, in the apartment is extremely important, unless at some point the defense can show that there was some relationship between him and somebody in the, in the apartment, or that he had been to the apartment. And I don't know that there's anything at this point that, that indicates that. It provides some context if it, if it fits into a timeline uh, that's important in this case. You know, of course, you know, the, these searches, you know, they're, they're, they're searching or have already searched every single click that Brian Kohlberger has made on his computer prior to these murders and, and even, you know, subsequent uh, to them because that's important as well. Um, you know, it, I, there's a lot of, of, you know, small, maybe what may seem insignificant individually, which is important when you're painting this overall picture uh, of, a, of a heinous crime being committed, you know, and it's going to be the prosecution's job to connect all these dots in the most effective and easiest manner to understand so the jurors can follow along and say, hey, well, you know, that didn't seem real important yesterday, but now that I know this, that's important. And, 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 and you, you keep building on, on this uh, sort of puzzle, this, this landscape that you want to paint uh, for the jurors to understand exactly what happened here. Koberger's defense team has countered police claims, saying their client wasn't in the home where the homicides occurred and was on a late night drive alone instead. So could we see Koberger as a witness in his own trial to get his side of the story? According to Mangino, it might be a wait and see until trial. You know, that is uh, the most important decision that any defendant and defense counsel uh, has to make. Uh, you know, do you take the stand? Now, one thing uh, that, that favors uh, Brian Kohlberger that, that a lot of defendants don't have is that he doesn't have a, a history. He doesn't have a history of, of uh, lying under oath. He doesn't have a history of falsehood. He doesn't have a, you know, uh, necessarily a history uh, of violence, certainly nothing like we have here. So, so that's always something that, that, that the defense has to consider, you know, if I put my client on the stand, do I open my client up to all these other issues? That's not necessarily the case here. Also, you know, unfortunately, not all people are are, are uh, trained or or have an educational background uh, in this whole forensic area, this whole uh, criminology area where he does. You know, he may make a good witness. Uh, he's obviously an intelligent person who was working on his PhD. So, you know, maybe he's, he, he can be an effective communicator. Those are all things that you have to factor in. Uh, and then, and then you also have to weigh how the trial is going itself. You know, if you, if you feel like things have went well in the state's, uh, case, you know, maybe you don't put your defendant on, even if you have confidence that he could testify well, because, you think you you can get a not guilty verdict without it. So so there's a lot that goes into making a decision about whether a defendant is going to take the witness stand or not. Despite various arguments from Koberger's defense, a judge ruled in late October that cameras could continue to be allowed inside the courtroom for the time being. But the judge said the cameras will be controlled and has said he does not want the trial or any court hearings to get out of control. 
Just last week, the FBI and state investigators returned to the Kings Road crime scene to gather more evidence, images, and measurements that could assist them in the trial. The University of Idaho says detectives plan to rebuild audio exhibits and a physical model of the home, so the university wouldn't be demolishing the crime scene anytime soon or until investigators have absolutely everything they need. Koberger is slated to appear back inside an Idaho courtroom in January. Whenever we get new information about the case or the trial, we'll be sure to let you know. Reporting for Law & Crime Network, I'm Elizabeth Milner.